Good morning, everyone. This is Sam Allred. I bring you greetings. I'm in my home office in Hebrew City, Utah. It's a beautiful day. But thanks so much for joining me for this introductory webinar for Leading Positive Change. I really believe that you'll find the time that we spend together this morning to be helpful and enlightening. I've tried to design something that I think you'll find beneficial, not just a marketing presentation on a program, but really some insight into how we make change happen or what stands in the way of change uh, being successful in terms of uh, our firms. I am recording this presentation, so it will be available. If, if you desire to record a copy of it or to share it with somebody else, it is being recorded. And as I always do with every presentation like this, I'll take questions at the end. So if you have them at all on anything we talk about or things that you feel like haven't been talked about as I go through this, please chat them in and go to webinar and I've got my chat screen up and I'll respond to those at the end. So let me kind of jump into this. Um, at Upstream Academy, we've been blessed to do what we really think are a lot of exciting and enjoyable things with the accounting profession. I tell people all the time when I'm traveling, I just did this last night on my flight home, that I've got the world's best job and what I get to do, and I sincerely believe that. We have the privilege and truly see it that way of working with well over 400 accounting firms across North America, and I believe we see in all of them a desire to change a desire to improve, to get better. And some firms obviously make better progress than others. And I have known and associated with hundreds of leaders in our profession over the last 33 years, and some are more impactful than others. And over these three decades, I've learned an important lesson about leadership. To me, the most reliable indicator of effective leadership is the ability to create positive results. And here's why this is so important. Change in any firm at any level with any initiative is difficult. Just ask anybody who's tried it. And I am always find the data, the research, the findings real sobering. Studies show that 70% of all change efforts fail. And, and, and obviously, for most leaders, that's not an impressive track record. Think about it. Almost every change initiative begins with this high level of anticipation, but somewhere along the journey, excitement changes to frustration, and the desired change that we had in mind seldom occurs, at least not in the way that we hoped that it would. And in, in so many firms, this is repeated over and over again. Get excited about something, set the parameters, begin the journey, and at some point we see frustration and the change doesn't happen in the way that we thought. And I'd ask you to consider the impact, such a failure rate, again, 70% based on research, and studies, the impact the failure rate has on the members of the firm and on the firm's culture. It's one of those things that becomes so challenging in the culture of people believing we are a firm that can change, can do what we say we're going to do. And then here's the point I really want to share with you and what I think is amazing to understand in many cases, in fact, maybe even most cases, the strategy behind the change is sound, and the change vision is the best thing for the firm and its people. In other words, you're often focused on the right things for the right reason at the right time, but why then is there so much failure? Why then do 70% of change initiatives fail if it's both strategic and it's helpful for the firm and its people. And maybe in many cases, the timing's okay. It's right. So please listen very carefully to this. The majority of change failures, change initiative failures, more than 70%, are due to employee resistance to the change and our leadership behavior that doesn't really um, support the change or isn't committed to the change. 
In other words, more most change failures, more than 70%, are not process failures, how you go about doing it. They're people failures. And this is the root cause of most of the change initiatives. And I give you just four. It's actually more than these four, but these are significant. Firm members across the firm at all levels who are securely anchored in the status quo. They're vested in keeping things the same way they are right now. Firm leaders, partners and others who give grudging compliance, not spirited commitment to the change initiative. In other words, you can spot grudging compliance. I always say this about grudging compliance, you can spot it a hundred yards away, but everybody can see that somebody's giving grudging compliance rather than spirited commitment. And, and negative obedience, if you want to call it that, is, is always the weakest form of leadership. A firm culture that keeps individuals from voicing their concerns and engaging in open and honest dialogue. There's just way too much artificial harmony within a firm, so somebody's not encouraged to share what causes you concern, what frustrates you with this, what makes you hesitant about this change is rarely discussed. A culture that fosters a genuine fear of failure and doesn't acknowledge that mistakes are, the term we use a lot, of tuition we pay to gain invaluable experience. So whenever you have artificial harmony, you have a genuine fear of failure. And when people fear failure, they're not willing to step out and do something different. And all change initiatives require us to do something different than we've been doing. And they're not willing to do that. And so there's a lot of different things that kill change, but I want to say more than 70% of the failures to change initiatives are people failures, and they fall into these kinds of buckets that I'm sharing right here on this slide number 10. We, we've studied, and one of the things I'll, I'll mention if I remember it later in this workshop, we've got 50 common change initiatives that we've studied within our profession that have had a pretty high rate of failure. And in most cases, again, as I mentioned earlier, the strategy behind the change is sound, and the firm and its people would really benefit from making the change. And so what I want to do to, I want to drill down on, on when I'm sharing this concept of why things are failing, I want to drill down and use an example. I want to focus on an example to better understand what's happening. And let's look at a uh, an example that's really common to our profession and analyze why it fails. It's common, it makes sense, it's strategic, it's good for the, 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 the people in the firm if we do this, why does it fail? Almost every firm in North America has tried to implement a plan to remove their worst clients from the firm. Uh, clients we commonly refer to as D-level clients. And leaders of firms confess and admit that the goal of trying to remove these D-level clients has been, for the most part, an almost complete failure. Why? Then follow along with me here as I kind of walk you through what's happening with this. The change initiative makes complete business sense for, for a host of reasons, including these four on this slide 12. These clients, the D-level clients, put a pit in the stomach of everybody who has to deal with them. Almost everybody dislikes the experience. And, and, and logic would tell you if, if somebody dislikes the experience and they have to do it over and over again, it's going to become increasingly frustrating. It's going to lead to less engagement. It's going to lead to greater turnover. It's going to lead to a lot of hesitancy and, and a host of other things. So that's the first thing. That why the change initiative makes sense is, hey, these clients put a pit in people's stomach. Number two, the clients undervalue our services, and they treat every invoice we send them like an invitation to a debate. That causes reluctance to record and bill all the time spent on their behalf, and that leads to frustration and, and um, anger in many cases that we're having to do work for clients. We can't even put all our time or bill them. And if we do bill them, we know we're going to get the phone call and it's going to be just another round of a debate that we're frustrated with. In other words, the relationship is way off course. Number three, these clients 
live in what Stephen R. Covey calls Quadrant One. I always love that and admire his insight on that. Quadrant One is things that are always urgent and always important, and they just consume the energy of people, and they just demand us. to. They get right in our face. We've got to deal with them. And when clients live in Quadrant One, and i got to tell you, all the clients live in Quadrant One because they don't have the discipline to work in Quadrant Two, which are things that are important but not urgent, never get in your face, never demand your time. Covey called that uh, the Quadrant of Quality. It was planning and preparation and values clarification and prevention and processes and all those really important things that if we do and we become a better organization, D-level clients are the most undisciplined clients on the planet, and they always live in quad quadrant one, and they require all who serve them to get into that same quadrant with them, and quadrant one wears people out. I'm doing a presentation next month, a management presentation for the profession. How do you get out of quadrant one? Because so many people get sucked into it. Well, one key, just only one, is quit serving D-level clients because they're like a Hoover Deluxe to suck you into quadrant one. And then the fourth reason why it makes sense is, gosh, those clients are, are almost always demanding and often they're high risk. They're always cutting corners. They're willing to throw others under the bus. They play the blame game. So again, for a host of reasons, it makes sense to remove them from the firm. So if it makes business sense to do this, to, to remove them, D-level clients from the firm, and it would be in the firm's best interest to do so, then again the question, why have most change efforts in this area failed? And this is so vital to understand. Too often, firms focus almost all of their efforts, their change initiative efforts, on the process, the steps they're going to follow, and spend too little effort on the people side of the issue. Think about the steps most firms take to get rid of their worst clients. And I'll tell you, this is within a stone's throw of all of the steps that people follow, firms have followed when they're trying to remove D-level clients, and they're fairly sound steps. Management believes in the initiative. It makes perfect sense to them. By the way, there's never a change initiative without a strong element of belief. It's the right thing. It'll be good for us. This is what we ought to do. Management convinces the partners to accept the change initiative. There's often great effort to help the partners see the wisdom behind the initiative, short-term and long-term, and talk it through. Um, number three, criteria is developed for A through D-level clients, and, and it's applied to the clients and so that, that, that each client receives you know, a, a rating, or in some cases, they don't do that. They just identify the D-level criteria and seek out. There's a searchlight that finds those clients on the list that fit that criteria. And the partners are expected to fire D-level clients and, and generally given a, a, a period of time to get them off, the, a reasonable period of time to get them off the firm's island. And then ultimately, there's few bus stops for bad clients. You could add a few extra steps for some firms, but the point I want to make is that for the most part, the steps are relatively logical. That's, that's what most firms go through to, to figure out how to remove D-level clients, but the end results have been largely a failure. Again, 70% of change initiatives fail, and, and again, 70% of the reasons they fail is people, not process. The process is relatively sound. So here's the takeaway. If you look only at the process you're going to follow, the steps you're going to take, and the communication you need, you may fail to help your partners and staff, everybody in the firm that's, in, that's connected to this change initiative, see the why, what, and how of the change. And firms often fail to enlist and ensure their help, their commitment, and often don't provide the training needed to help people make the change. You could look at this one example and realize there's some training needed. How many partners and others have had the experience and feel comfortable sitting down with a client and telling them there needs to be a bus stop? 
just just take that alone. There's other factors in this, but just take that alone, and then take the partners that 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 um, are are not good, and, and others who are not good at business development, and, and look at what happens when they then remove billable work in their view, billable work. Who cares that it's not getting money in the bank? It's billable work because that's always one spotlight that swings around and can become a searchlight and removes billable work, and then they don't have the ability to replace it. Or, or what about what do they do with the big concern they might have if there's if, if compensation or at least a belief that compensation is tied to, to billable hour work? What happens to somebody's? compensation and the fear that it's going to go down if you remove D-level clients and a host of other things, how to do it, how to approach it, the training that might be needed. More emphasis needs to be spent here because this has traditionally been one of the great killers of change initiatives is going to be people's behavior. So here's one of the takeaways that I would give you, the big takeaway on this part. When focusing on successful change initiatives, which is always our desire that they be successful, place equal emphasis on process. What are the steps we're going to follow to really move the dial, move the needle, and behavior, how people behave in pursuit of the results. Both are vitally important in, in having success. Now, if the Previous slides strike any kind of a familiar chord with you, or they seem all too familiar in your firm, or as Yogi Berra once said, it feels like deja vu all over again. I want you to know that really one of the purposes of, of this webinar is to share that we can help with this. We can help you improve the success of your change initiatives, and that's the reason why we develop the Leading Positive Change workshop. And I just want to take a few slides and explain really what that is. The, the singular or primary focus of, the, of this upstream program is to help you achieve way better results in teaching uh, you how to lead positive change within your firm, how to significantly improve the results of your change initiative at all levels within the firm. And let me give you an overview concise overview of, of, of what the program is. It's a three-day workshop, more technically to be accurate. It's a two-and-a-half-day workshop. The intent is that individuals would fly in the night before it begins and be able to fly out that third day, and so we end at noon or shortly thereafter. It's a three-day workshop. It's going to be held on November 14th through 16th. That's a Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. It is being held in Chicago. It's near the O'Hare Airport at a hotel. And um, in addition to that two-and-a-half-day workshop, roughly six months or so later, in the spring of 2018, there will be a follow-up remote session, which gives all of the participants a chance to return and report back on the pro specific progress they've made as a direct result of what they've learned in the workshop and received some additional training. The enrollment is limited to 50 participants. That will be the class size. And those participants, it's deemed that they're currently serving or being trained to serve in significant leadership roles. These are the kind of roles that we would probably anticipate or envision that those individuals are either in or being prepared to serve in those positions. Managing partners and CEOs of firms, EC and board members, members of management teams, individuals that are in charge of offices, our regions, our service lines, or segments, or industry groups, or niches. Those in the firm who have a significant responsibility to lead change, that's who we would anticipate would uh, be, a, be in attendance at the workshop. And then here's six uh, key elements of this workshop. I want to take a minute or two, and I'm going to go through each of these. First, the instructors for the workshop will be Gordon Crater and myself. Many of you know who Gordon Crater is. He's the current managing partner of Plant Moran. He steps down as the managing partner next month on June 30th. 
He is an incredible, dynamic leader within our profession and one of the most professional and approachable people I know. And We have been good friends for almost two decades. I have the highest respect for him. Uh, he and I have talked about doing something, and, and as we talked about that, one of the greatest talents and skills he brings is what he's done with his firm and even helping others and having success with change initiatives and especially in creating a culture that embraces change rather than all of those barriers you saw on a previous slide where people fight it back on 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 uh, whatever slide that was where I shared the you know major buckets the people within that fought change he's done an incredible job leading that and so he and I will be the two instructors for the workshop. We will be taking what we're calling a holistic approach to change. We'll teach a process that really takes a lot of the guesswork out of change management, a process that leans heavily on the people side of the change process to really make sure that you're addressing all of the different issues that I brought up earlier that, that happen that are so vital that, that we understand and need to overcome. I'm going to take a few minutes and just walk you through and give you a real feel for what what the agenda is going to be after the welcome and introductions. And I guess I ought to start by pointing out it's got day one, day two, and day three. And day three is going to go, as I mentioned, till noon. You'll notice that throughout the two and a half days, there'll be three different seating assignments. Um, it, it is a workshop and will be very interactive as a workshop. And people will be seating, uh, sitting in different assigned teams. And that will give you a chance to know the different participants and get to learn them and see different approaches. And that's going to be so important to see different personalities and approaches and thoughts and ideas as we're talking about change, given that more than 70% of the failures have to do with people and their personalities and their thoughts and their ideas and their reluctance. It's going to be really, really important to get an experience with different team members throughout that three-day or two and a half day workshop. So after the welcome and introduction, we'll discuss the 10 key principles of effective change. I'm going to set that aside just for a minute because I'm going to discuss more about that in a, in a slide in just a few minutes and a slide will come up with those 10 key principles. We'll take a deep dive into the question, why do most change efforts fail? I've given kind of a shallow view of that here, but we're really going to dive deep into that. We're going to discuss the best way to create a culture for change. Not, not just how do, you fight the, 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 how do you fight the resistance that comes up, how do you overcome the resistance, but ultimately, how do you create a culture where there's less and less resistance? There's more of an embracement of change rather than a risk resistance to it. And that's really one of the greatest areas of expertise that Gordon brings to this is to share What's the very best way to build that? What's vital? What are the foundations to really building that culture of change? And then knowing that nothing changes without a catalyst, then we're going to take an in-depth look at how do you really develop and enable change agents at all levels of the firm that help you with this culture of change and help you have greater success with your change initiatives. What is the best way to measure change? In other words, what, as we use this term here, what constitutes the needle or the dial really moving? And we're really going to, you know, when it's an objective change initiative, it's easier. Hey, we want to improve AR over 90 days. We, we, we want to uh, 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 drive 8% uh, um, organic growth. That's more measurable and the dials are easier to find. But often, individuals struggle to measure subjective change initiatives. So we're going to talk a lot about and do a lot of exercises. How do you measure as a team? How do you measure this change initiative? And it's largely subjective. We'll go to work as teams and learn the process by which you measure how you move dials in subjective areas. And then all afternoon of the first day is going to be, and that'll be after lunch, we're going to focus on the change process. We have 50 case studies, They're, they'll be in the, in the workbook, of major problems, common problems to our profession, things that firms need to change, want to change, but they struggle to do so. And each team is going to select that first day the one they want to work on. 
we, we don't particularly care. Take one. Take one that's passionate to the team, important to the team. So we'll lead you through a process. The team will pick one of those case studies, and they will walk through the change process, the steps, to develop and present. And really what they're doing here is walking through this change process on the right-hand side, going through what are the benefits. If you could move the dial, what are the barriers that stand in the way? How are we going to really identify if the dial's moving, and then what kind of action plan do we need? And largely the barriers are people related. We're going to spend a lot of time on that. And then how are we going to communicate it, and then how are we going to stick with it? They're going to walk through and develop an action plan and actually present it, each team, present that action plan, and everyone else in the group is going to act as members of the firm, partners or others, and give feedback to what they're hearing. Honest feedback, which would include pushback, which would include acceptance, which would include what they liked and didn't like about what they heard. And from that, they'll have a chance to revise their plan. So that's the whole afternoon of day one. If you actually glance at the end of day two, that's the afternoon of day two as well, although it's different teams and picking a different problem. It's the chance to go through and say, if this is what we want to change, how are we going to go about doing that effectively to really ensure that we have success and not failure and taking the whole people initiative into account, behavior, as well as process, and get feedback on that? There's a lot to that, but I wanted to share this so that you'd see that. Day two, we're going to talk about uh, the danger of passive resistors. The most challenging resistance to change always comes from passive resistors, not the vocal active resistors. We're going to talk about how to select what to change, what to focus on, what we call surveying large fields and cultivating small fields. By the way, that's, that is one of the, 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 the key principles of effective change. We're going to talk about the proper pace of change. How much change can one firm handle? I, I think one of the biggest mistakes otherwise good leaders make and is taking on too many change initiatives and they try to move too many dials at once and water everything down and get frustrated and then we we see the, the negative results of that and the failures that accompany that. We're going to talk about what communication is needed. And, and that'll be something that the teams work on, and we do a lot of training on that. And Gordon has a lot to offer in that area. And then again, we'll, we'll take the whole afternoon and go through the change process and problem solving round two uh, on different teams on day two that we had on day one. And day three, we begin by talking about gentle pressure relentlessly applied. That's one of the key principles, but it's really the discipline needed. The last step in the change process is discipline execution, and too many firms honestly are guilty of what I, what I call um, uphill, setting uphill goals and having downhill habits, and they just aren't in alignment, and, and that's one of the reasons why there's so much failure. And so we'll talk about what the discipline is needed to really allow the change to happen and, 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 and be successful. We feel like it's really important to talk about the, the, the need to celebrate change. I mean, celebrating positive change is a tool for cultivating a success mindset. So, so when you notice and celebrate positive change, then everybody throughout the firm starts to see the firm as being successful rather than trying to be successful. And it's an important part of that building that culture for change is learning how to celebrate the progress you're making. And, and firms honestly suck at that. I gotta be honest, they struggle with that. We see too many firms that just, that they might put great effort in and it might be one of those initiatives that even has success and they, they, they fail to take the time to celebrate it and it's so vital to building the culture you wanna have. And then, and then we're going to uh, end it with, with three different things. The top changes firms need to make. We, we are in a, a very interesting time, more so than any other time, I think, in our profession's history, and there's a lot of disruptions coming. And so we're going to share our thoughts, Gordon and I, on, on just not, not the 50 things that firms need to focus on um, that, that are there in that workbook, that, you know, the change initiatives that haven't been that successful. And, uh, we're going to talk about the major changes coming that firms really do need to thrive in the future. Uh, things they need to, to, to changes they need to make if they really want to be highly successful, and um, and not just end up merging somewhere. 
And then we're going to talk about just some a thoughts at the end. We're calling them words of wisdom, but some key thoughts that each of us have that we want to share. And then golden nuggets, we always do that in our workshops. What are the most important things that you learned over the last two and a half days that you want to share? And that will be in the notes that you can take. And there will be a pretty comprehensive notes that we take throughout for the entire group that we send to everybody that's in that group of the notes that have been taken. So that's really, it gives you a feel for the agenda that we're going to follow for two and a half days. As I've mentioned, it's really going to be an interactive workshop with three different seating assignments and, and uh, uh, um, tables or teams will be engaged in case studies and exercises and questions that they respond to throughout the, the, the workshop. It just, we, we, we just really feel like that's what that's what you do to really learn how to lead change. It's not just listening, it's doing things, and that's the best way to learn them. We also believe that networking with your peers, other leaders uh, of firms, in a stimulating group environment is important, and it's helpful. And, and it opens your eyes, especially when we realize, again, that it's the people side of things that kills change. It's the behavior that kills change. It's important to really network and interact, and, and uh, we're going to really set that up, I think, in a way that will be very effective. Uh, teams will be allowed to select the exercises they want to work on, and um, I think that will be fun for them to collaborate and figure out how they're going to select and what exercise they want, and rather than us just assigning those. And we talked a lot about that as we've met and planned this, and we think that will be very effective. Then I want to talk about um, key principles. An important part of effective change is really understanding key principles. And first of all, let me define a principle and you'll see why I think it's so important. A principle is a tenet, an anchor, an enduring truth that guides in how you make decisions. And principles don't change. They don't change because there's changes in the market. They don't change because there's disruptors. They don't change because there's opportunities. The reason why I Finding principles to be so important is they're solid, they're anchors, and they don't change. And good things consistently happen when correct principles are followed, and challenging things almost always happen when principles are violated. And in working with Gordon on this and the time we've spent, we've We've learned through our experience that there's key principles associated with leading positive change within an accounting firm. And so throughout the workshop, we're going to continually reference these 10 principles. And, and just, to, just to, to share the title of them, surveying large fields, cultivating small ones, being selective, what you choose and how you choose the things you're going to work on, having success early and building on it, uh, failure is a horrible foundation to build on. And so with change initiative, how do you set it up to where you're able to report success early rather than failure? Um, don't expect immediate buy-in. Some of these are things to do and some of these are things not to do, but they're key principles. And so often we get so frustrated. We, we, we get frustrated with partners that they can't understand why this is important or embrace it. And, we, we fail to realize as leaders we've been talking about this and got up above the trees and planned it and looked at it and saw all the issues in the firm and saw why this would be sound and smart and our partners of others have had their heads down buried in deadlines and dealing with things and we get so frustrated when we don't get immediate buy-in and sometimes we kill that and we push it too fast because we can see why it's the right thing. You get to celebrate what you measure. It's so important that both that covers two different things, both the importance of measuring and the importance of celebrating. Creating a robust communication plan is vital. And, and why so often things fail because we fail to communicate well. Avoid the strategy of hope. You know, there's just no way we're not going to put that in there somewhere because in many cases that's one of the great killers of things is people don't fully plan and they just want to, Hope it's all going to turn out. Hey, we're picking something wise. We know it's beneficial. Let's just go do it. Good things will happen. Remember the fish stinks from the head is an example about leadership, about where we start, about the commitment of leaders that's needed. And if we don't have it, nothing ever is successful. Apply gentle, relentless pressure. 
it is really the last step of, of disciplined execution, but there's some key parts of that principle. Identify and enlist the influencers is so important and it's such a vital principle of change and how you create a culture for change. And then beware of unintended consequences. Uh, one of the things that Gordon brings to this is so many examples and stories about not only what works, but what doesn't work. And, and so many of these fall into that principle of beware of unintended consequences to really think through each thing that you do to ensure it's going to have the results you want, not just be a disaster. A couple other uh, quick things. From day one, when we started Upstream Academy a little over 15 years ago, we felt really strong that everything that we did should be unconditionally guaranteed to our clients' full satisfaction. And so it's just what it says. We, we just There's no hiding behind that. We stand behind it and, and believe that. If you're not completely satisfied, we will at your option either waive your fee or accept that portion of the fee that reflects your level of satisfaction that applies to every single thing we do within Upstream Academy. And we proudly stand behind it, and that motivates us and pushes us to, to um, do quality things. And then, as you would expect, and I just threw this in there, there's CPE. I don't know exactly what it will be. Uh, it will be a minimum of 22 hours for the workshop. It's possible the workshop may go a little longer in the evenings, and so it will be more than 22 credits, if you will, but it will be at least 22 credits for that workshop that people that two and a half day workshop that they attend. And then the investment in the program, for each participant to attend the workshop, it's $3,500. There's a discount for additional participants from the same firm, and as there always is, there's a discount if somebody belongs to Upstream Academy Network, and that's the investment that they would be making in the program. And then just a last thought, I mean, our, our passion and what we love doing is to help firms and individuals in our profession get better. As we look back over the last 15 years, we've established a really successful track record of being able to do that. And we're just supremely confident and excited that the Leading Positive Change Workshop is really going to help the, the participants and their firms make significant, measurable progress on change initiatives and what they do with that. And so with that, let me go to the questions. And I've got some that have been chatted in and encourage you at this time, if, if you've got questions, chat them in and I'll, I'll just respond to the questions and, and, and we'll be done and I'll wrap it up. If you were to pick a couple of people to send to this program, would you send the people who have demonstrated the most skill at changing culture or the people who have been more of a boat anchor to change? That's really a good question. Um, you know, I'm always hesitant to, 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 well, I know you're not saying this, but sometimes we feel like uh, we'll get the question that says, gosh, we throw our hands up. This person's never, ever going to get where we need them to get to. We're going to give you one last final shot to change them. And we feel sometimes like we've got a program that's full of prisoners. There's somebody that doesn't want to be there. So first and foremost, let me start with that first and then come to your question. Everybody that comes to something like this, and then certainly the investment that's, that, that you're making, which isn't cheap, we get that, it needs to be somebody that wants to be there, that, that's coming to learn, coming to embrace, coming to be enlightened, coming to change what they've been doing. If somebody is coming with that spirit and that desire, then I don't know that I care as much whether they've been highly successful in demonstrating really good skill at changing culture or people or whether they've been resistant. Now, logic would say if they've been resistant to change, they probably would likely not come to something like this with that right attitude. So that's, that's how I would answer that question. It's so important that somebody's coming not, I don't know that I want to say not with some skepticism, because by the way, I think questioning things is healthy, not bad. I like to see that, but there's a difference between questioning things and throwing out anchors and saying there's no way that, that I'm going to see this different or whatever. So that's what I would just say with that is make sure that the people come want to learn the process and are willing to 
practice it and ask questions and get engaged, it's going to be really enlightening to see, oh, this is why we need to involve people, why we need to open up, why we need to have honest dialogue, why we need to look at the right kind of training that's needed. And to the extent that they come with that attitude, they're going to love it and learn and come back a much better leader ready to implement and, and, and do something very different than they've done in, in the past. Another question. One issue we found is that there may be a low sense of self-awareness for team members. We view their performance at a certain level and they see it as much higher. What are your recommendations for facilitating self-awareness? And, and I'll tell you, self-awareness is interestingly tied into EQ, emotional quotient, and how you interact with people. It's not an IQ thing. So you could have somebody really intelligent, super intelligent, way high up on IQ, but from an EQ standpoint, because the two are very different, they don't get why something's not working and why somebody has pushback and why somebody's not involving them. And they're just, they're, they have very low self-awareness, even though they have incredible high IQ. Now, by the way, EQ can be taught. E, somebody can be helped with EQ. It starts with honestly having a good, honest crucial conversation in a safe environment where somebody doesn't feel like they're being attacked, but they're being helped. But but what I find so often is, does somebody want the feedback? And and David Meister does a great job in true professionalism talking about the value of feedback. He says, the best way to get better at anything is to get feedback. And if you don't want feedback, it's quite likely you won't get better at anything. And, and that's what I see with the self-awareness is Somebody might not get exactly what they're doing, but would they like feedback? Are they willing to receive feedback? Are they willing to really think about it? Are they ultimately willing to embrace it? I find if they will, the EQ side can be taught and it can come better and they can get better and better at it. But when they don't want feedback and they don't want to hear it, then I kind of go back to what Jeff asked in that first question. Should I send somebody that's a boat anchor to this? And and I kind of say, gosh, they're going to feel like a prisoner, and you're going to spend a lot of money and may not get much of return on the investment. So, so we can teach the process. We can teach uh, some of the EQ side of this because so much of the behavioral side of what's killing change is on the EQ side of things, certainly not on the IQ side of things. And we can teach that and plan to teach that. Again, what I'm saying in both of these, somebody has to want to listen and learn and somebody that comes to something ought to not feel like a prisoner. Not only is it not fun for us, that ought to be obvious, but it's not going to be fun for them, and they're not going to get as much out of it. And so that's I would respond to both of those somewhat similarly. As an addition to that, these folks could be change agents, but self-awareness can impede this. It always does. A, a change agent, by the way, let me just, and, and I love that comment that Megan's making here, uh, one of the elements of a change agent, an effective change agent, is a good level of EQ, interaction with people, reading people, understanding people, a sense of what to say and not to say. Those are far more effective change agents than people that lack self-awareness because when you lack self-awareness, you have low EQ. You could have great IQ again, but low EQ. So that's a really interesting comment that you're making is that for somebody to be an effective change agent, by the way, we teach that, that when you're going out to find change agents in the firm, who do you look for? And ideally, it's at all levels, not just at certain levels. At all levels, you're finding and developing and enabling change agents. And one of the key things you're looking for is people that have really good people skills. They're, they're as, as Patrick Lenziani would say in his book, The Ideal Team Player, they're smart. They're people smart in, in how they interact with people. Those individuals will always make better change agents than those who lack the EQ and aren't highly self-aware. Good, good question. Next one, would it be appropriate to have a firm administrator attend? And I'm assuming that question is being asked. Is back on slide 21. We didn't list, list firm and, uh, administrators. We're not trying to give you the exhaustive list. Anybody in the firm that has a responsibility to help lead change and lead others, that's who this is for. That's not meant to be an exhaustive list. I could see that somebody could be a HR director and, and, and could be, you know, I, I, I was with the firm two weeks ago and, and, and the chief people officer uh, 
would be a perfect person for this type of thing because of how much change they're expected to lead and the responsibility they have. So please realize slide 21, as you go back and look, isn't meant to be the exhaustive list. It's just giving a list of some of the kinds of people that, that really have a great responsibility in the firm to lead, lead change. Next question, will there be any prerequisites Will there be any prerequisite work required for this workshop? Uh, may or may not be. I don't know. I mean, do you realize it is in November? And um, it's possible. I, I just looked, talked to Gordon this morning about an article that we looked at I, that, that, that was a letter written to all the shareholders of, of um, was it Google? Let me just grab that really quick and see. Make sure I don't misquote it. Amazon. And uh, man, does it fall right into this. Uh, it was something he sent me. We had a chat on it this morning, and, and um, there may be some things like that. They, they would not be uh, intensive and extensive. That, that's a wonderful way to turn people into liars. Did everybody read it? Everybody will nod their head because nobody wants to disclose that they didn't because it was a, you know, a volumes. It won't be that. But there may be some reading. It may be uh, some pages, some chapters, some articles, some things like that. I could see that there could be prior to this some uh, prerequisite reading just to get in the mindset of this, and certainly that letter from the CEO of Amazon to the shareholders about what day two looks like. He is always talking about what day one is. Somebody said, what does day two look like? And that's the beginning of the end because you can't change and you haven't changed. That may be a good article that we have people read, so there could be for that. Uh, last question, unless you've got more. Um, down. Thank you. Somebody just sending a thank you. The last question I see is what size firms is this being marketed to? All sizes. This isn't size specific. This is not size specific. We would expect that we will have firms in the top 100, 200, 300, 400, maybe 500. That that we would expect that. Um, that that's that's it, it's about how to lead change, not necessarily how to lead change in a super big firm or a small firm. Because if you look at the barriers, you go back and look at, at the buckets I put up of, of, and again, there were four of them. That's back on slide 10. That's not size related. The, the behavior that's killing change, over 70% of change initiatives that fail is based on behavior of people. That's not size related at all. It's behavior related. And you'll see it in firms of all sizes. And we're teaching how to, how to overcome that, how to change that, how to create a culture. Logic might say that it may take a little longer to create a culture of change in a larger firm with more moving parts than a smaller firm. I'm not sure if that's true or not. Logically, I would think that might be true. But um, we're going to talk about the process of how you, how you create a culture of change and how you lead change initiatives effectively and have great success with them, not great failure. And, and it's going to apply to firms of all sizes. I don't see any other questions. If you get them, Here's my email address, um, samadupstreamacademy.com. Please send me an email. I'll give you a detailed reply. I hope that this was helpful. Again, I thank you for taking the time and sitting through this and hope that it was a benefit to you. Best wishes. Have a great day. We'll see you later. Bye-bye.